Um, so hello everybody. Uh, thanks very much for joining us for Takeshi Hayatsu's talk, Myths, Dreams, and Fairy Tales. Uh, and uh, first, we would like to acknowledge that these informal talks happen on Gadiga land, a land that was never ceded and, and remains like that, and always was, always will be Aboriginal land, uh, despite this is happening virtual today, but I'm joining from, from my home, uh, which is on, on Gadiga land. Um, um, also, we would like to thank uh, the Japan Foundation in Sydney for keep uh, supporting uh, these collaborations between Australian education, architectural education, and, and Japan. In this case, bringing today Takeshi Hayatsu, virtually bringing, and next week, uh, Momoyo Kajima from Material Book Bow, no? that joins the series of talks we have been doing for, for the last year with Erika Nakagawa, with a, a lot of um, young practitioners from Japan doing uh, the things we like. Um, and Takeshi, in this case, um, is somebody that's relevant for many cases for our studio that uh, we, we admire his work. We admire also um, his, his parallel take on, on Japanese architecture, as he explains brilli brilliantly on the Escafold podcast that some of you may have listened to. And also some of the things we, we like to listen here, Takeshi. And Takeshi Hayatsu is a Japanese architect based in London. Takeshi studied architecture at Musaino Art University in Tokyo and the Architectural Association in London. Uh, he worked for David Chipperfield Architects, Howard Tompkins, and CSA Architects, um, like uh, some of the well-known projects that you know, like the uh, Cowan Court and, and others. Uh, and finally, establishing Hayatsu Architects uh, in, in 2017. Uh, alongside his practices, he teaches a Mark unit in Kingston School of Art, where he's doing some of the best uh, design and build studios in the world. And he also conducts annual summer school in Japan in Grisalda Arts that I think he, he was back this year uh, doing very interesting job uh, there uh, also with the, with the community. And today I think he's gonna focus more on, on his project that you can see on the screen, uh, uh, Made in Bermondsey, like uh, where some of these investigations into the design and build uh, move from the classroom to the community. Um, and, and, and I think uh, we, uh, we are very happy to, to be able to listen to, to, to Takeshi today for his myths, dreams, and fairy tales. Please join me in welcoming Takeshi Hadiatsu. Thank you, Takeshi. Thank you, Graham. Uh, let me share the screen. Uh, okay. Does it look okay? Great. Uh, yes, uh, as <laughs> uh, introduced, my, my name is Takeshi Hayatsu, and I have a small architecture practice in uh, called Hayatsu Architects, uh, based in Bermondsey in South London. Uh, as you said, it was established in 2017, so it's been five years so far. Um, today's lecture is titled Myth dreams and fairy tales. And I'd like to talk about my personal journey on how I rediscovered my history and uh, fascination through the things we make. So after studying architecture in Tokyo, I moved to London in 1993 to complete my master at the Architecture Association. Uh, this is Young Me, which is here. Um, uh, in the AA library in Bedford Square, uh, no sight of laptop in this picture, which tells how long ago it was. Um, I never thought I would stay in the UK for this long. Uh, in fact, I had no idea where I'd be or what I would become. I was attracted to Archigram and other UK architecture scene at the time. I wasn't uh, interested in Japanese architecture at all before I moved to the UK. Now, I try to go back at least once a year and visit places like old shrines and temples. Um, this is one of my highlights from this visit. Um, Nageiredo of Sanbutsuji Temple in Tottori Prefecture. It is a Buddhist temple in a mountain built in Heian period, which is 704 to 1184. Um, Shingon Mikyo combines old Shintoism, Taoism, Shamanism, and Japanese folk animism. 
The temple is built in the cliff, so typologically, it is half cave dwelling and half Kengai Zukuri, uh, which is timber lattice construction, which projects out from the vertical surface. There's a myth that monks use their superpower and threw the prefabricated temple into the hole on the cliff. It is mind boggling how monks managed to build this, but uh, seemingly haphazard look of timber stilts suggests some improvisations on site. The length of stilts is measuring the form of rock. When you stand inside, opening frames the view towards the valley. This is a happy marriage of nature and man-made, revealing and enhancing the place's quality. It is part of a larger monastery complex and takes about two hours to get to the temple by foot. You need to climb up along the steep cliff. Every year, people die from visiting this temple by falling off. The place is already very special. The building came after. They are there to frame the, nat the nature and enhance its special quality. And the place is full of mysterious things, like this old tree with the Shimenawa, a straw rope symbolizing purification. And enigmatic stone statues. The roadside statue called Jizo is everywhere in Japan, even in an urban environment. A small shrine for the roadside god is kept even the surrounding condition has changed. And people look after them. As you can see here, someone placed a suite in front of the statue. Japanese folklore depicts many monsters on roadside. It is a kind of mountain spirit, which people had close encounters during nighttime. Japanese animation film, My Neighbor Totoro by Hayao Miyazaki in 1988, also describes the story of two young sisters' close encounters with mythical creatures. This fairy tale story is overlaid with a familiar landscape of roadside statues and shrines. And how the characters behave towards them. Here they are praying for the st statue to stop raining so that they can go home. And paying respect to nature. Note that the tree is raised with the sacred Shimenawa rope. Tree has a special position in Japanese rituals. This is Onbashira uh, from Suwa Taisha Shrine in Nagano Prefecture, a symbolic standing pole for the ancient shrine. By custom, the Onbashira are replaced every six years in the year of the monkey and tiger in the Chinese zodiac. In Shua, Suwa Shrine, this occurs during the Onbashira festival which also functions as a symbolic renewal of the shrine's buildings. During the festival, 16 specially chosen fir trees are felled and then transported down the mountain, where they are then erected at the four corners of each shrine every six years. This is Yamadashi, literally means coming out of the mountains. 16 fir trees, usually about 17 to 19 meters tall, are selected and cut down in a Shinto ceremony using specially made axes and adze. The logs are de decorated in red and white. The tra traditional colors of Shinto ceremonies and ropes are attached. During the Yamadashi, teams of people drag the logs down the mountain towards the shrine. The course of the logs goes over rough terrain, and at certain points, the logs must be skidded or dropped down steep slopes. Young men prove their bravery by riding on the logs, which can weigh as much as 12 tons, down the hill in the ceremony known as Kiyotoshi. 
And this is the next phase of the festival called Satobiki. During Satobiki, held about a month later, the logs are paraded to the four shrine buildings where they will be erected. Four onbashira are erected at each building, at one at each corner. The logs are raised with ropes by hand, and while they are being raised, a ceremonial group uh, uh, of log bearers ride the logs and sing and perform other feats. This is Ise Grand Shrine in Mie Prefecture. Famously, these shrine buildings are, are rebuilt every 20 years. The Okihiki Festival is held in the spring over two consecutive years and involves people from surrounding towns dragging huge wooden logs through the streets of Ise to the shrine. A year after the completion of Okihiki Festival, carpenters begin preparing the wood for its eventual use in the shrine. This is called Shimbashira Oiya, a small uh, wooden uh, hut uh, protecting the position of sacred wooden posts before the rebuilding starts. This diagram shows the relationship to the rebuilding of the shrine building. Effectively, the Issei shrine building is an uh, elaborated version of the hut protecting the symbolic tree inside. This is another ancient shrine, Izumo Taisha Shrine, in Shimane Prefecture. This shrine boasts the la Japan's largest Shimenawa rope. There is no knowledge of exactly when Izumo Taisha was built originally, but a record compi uh, compiled around 950, which is a Heian period, describes the shrine as the highest building reaching approximately 48 meters. Uh, this is a model of the reconstruction of the ancient shrine building based on the record. The building also contained the symbolic Shinomi Bashira post in its heart. The archeological survey in 2000 proved that myth was actually true they discover the remaining of the massive columns. Three uh, uh, tree trunks are bundled together to form a one large column. Because Japanese carpentry is closely linked to Shintoism and animism, the rituals of re respecting wood are exercised to the present day. Here, Miyadaike uh, carpenter Tsunekazu Nishioka exercising the Shinto ritual ceremony. During the construction of temple, the carpenters pray for three times, start of construction, erecting the first column, and topping out. They use a special ax. One side is marked with uh, three lines symbolizing God's drink, which is sake and other side is marked with four lines symbolizing sun, soil, water, and air, essential elements for growing trees. They use this ax when they fell tree in order to pay their utmost respect. This closeness to the nature at the spiritual level seems to be very important and relevant to the 21st century at the age of climate change and scarcity of resources. I started teaching architecture in 2010 when I got the teaching position in Kingston University. I thought about what I can teach and maybe I can teach about Japanese architecture and learn about it with the students. I also thought that I want to use workshop as my classroom Universities here in the UK are equipped with workshop facilities, allowing students to work with wood, metal, and other materials such as plaster. I thought that it would be interesting to incorporate the workshop into my teaching, building large-scale structures as a tool for research and investigation. 
This was partly driven by a reaction against the image dominating internet culture. I wanted the learning to be physical. So the first thing uh, we did was to build a scale replica of this 16th century timber Kintaikyo bridge in Iwakuni, Yamaguchi prefecture. We built it in one to three scale using only two by two and two by three Scottish spruce spanning over 10 meters. It was made in the Kingston's workshop and placed over Hogsmill River, allowing our entire studio, which was 22 of us, to walk across and stand on it like this. We continue this approach of studying Japanese historic wooden structures closely and building them together in the workshop. We built a one to four scale replica of Todaiji Nandaimon in Nara, again, only using two by two and two by three softwood. The original structure is a 12th century timber gate over 27 meters tall which we replicate with over 3,000 blocks of support cantilevered brackets. It is about collaboration and teamwork, including project management, health and safety, and fundraising. Kingston Borough, where the university is located, is a suburb of London. From 1910 to 1930, the place underwent rapid change of suburban sprawl within the short period of 20 years, as this two map shows. Through the work in Kingston, I met this man, Robin Hutchinson, the leader of the community brain. A charity company promotes and empowers the local community. He believes that everyone is brilliant and everyone needs a place to be a brilliant. He knows that history gives pride and identity to the people. The place like Tolwas, which is a suburban town part of the Kingston Borough, where the history is not so visible because of the rapid change, he promotes the obscure local story such as the pub Toby Jug, where David Bowie played his Ziggy Stardust show for the first time in 1972. He also creates history where he, it doesn't exist. He wrote a children's book called The Legend of Leffy Gunderson, the Goat Boy of Mount Seething. And every spring in Sarbiton, another suburban town in Kingston, the community get together to march for the goat boy Leffy to celebrate Leffy saving the village by defeating the giant Thomas Deaton. So we proposed to Robin to join the festival with a mobile festival float called Sarbiton Yatai in 2018. It was part of the university semester's assignment to investigate Japanese festivals and floor structures. In Japan, this kind of a large wheeled festival structure is everywhere. It is usually stored in a local shrine or temple. Um, it is assembled before the festival and some are so large reaching almost to an architectural scale. It acts as a means to gather the community together and transform the place during the festival. This 27 meter tall spire-like uh, structure in Gion Matsuri festival in Kyoto is raised slowly by hundreds of people pulling ropes during the festival preparations. The construction process itself becomes a performance. So similar to this, our flat pack structure was assembled before the festival starts. It was inspired by the uh, Kiku Andon Matsuri Festival in Kanagawa. Instead of original red paper lanterns, our float functions as a mobile seed bank, carrying pots of plants and seeds. 
The hanging pockets are made from recycled milk bottles, a sort of DIY technique learned from the nearby allotment gardens. The plants and seeds were given away during the festival to encourage the people to, to grow their own flowers and herbs. It was also a symbolic structure which was pulled by the local children. Our collaboration with my Kingston students and the community brain is continuing and growing. This is the latest installment for Tolwas Nature Reserve. We designed and built a strawberry nature uh, hide. It is perched on the edge of the pond in a council managed nature reserve in Tolwas. Um, this diagram shows the idea of co-designing and co-building process. So instead of compressing the conception of design to construction in one academic year, the idea here is to stretch the process over two or three years by passing the project from one generation to the next. Through this reciprocating cycle, the students get to experience the various stages of building activities through the real engagement with stakeholders and users. First, we held a design competition within our unit. Every student proposed their design proposal. This was the conception stage, effectively building a project brief with the stakeholders. And we judged the designs with the members of the committee brain here, George Anisham, and biodiversity officer, Elliot Newton from Kingston Council. The selected proposal was then further developed collectively with the students and tutors. The bearded man here it was my co-tutor architect, Jim Reed. Then prefabricated in the workshop before it was delivered on site. The structure was then erected on site with the next cohort of students. We are interested in the idea of collective making we got involved the local school children for decorating the external cladding. Using the paint mixed with locally dug out clay, flour, and linseed oil, which was also made and prepared by the students, and produced a large quantity of decorated cladding boards in the school's assembly hall. So these self-building approaches involving many people we have been experimenting in Kingston had a direct influence on the regeneration project for the brew market in Bermondsey, South London. So this is the main topic of this lecture. It is a refurbishment of existing marketplace and associated urban interventions around the market. We were commissioned by the council through a competitive interview process. Uh, this is a picture of a marketplace before we got involved. It was just concrete pavers and concrete bollards. The place felt empty and cold. The marketplace was built in 1970s as part of the war clearance of the area. Originally, the market was on the street. It is a historic market tracing back to the 12th century. Started as a pilgrimage route for nearby Bermondsey Abbey. Due to the proximity to Surrey Dock, where most of the goods were transported for London, the area was once a hub of economy and industry. In the heyday, over 200 stalls lined the street and it was called London's Larder. But dock closed and all the industry moved out of the area. The market slowly declined and by 2019, only one trader left. Um, that was the fishmonger, Russell Dryden. He was born in the brew, grew up in the brew and been a fishmonger for more than 30 years. He brought local business partners together and raised the fund for upgrading the market and its surrounding area. They were granted two million pounds from the mayor of London through their good growth fund scheme. 
we uh, were appointed as a main designer or lead, lead consultant of the multidisciplinary team comprising cost consultant Greece, retail specialist retail revival, lighting specialist studio Decca, landscape architect Jonathan Cook, graphic designer Stinson Squeeze, and art and architecture collective Assemble. We titled our project name Made in Bamanzi. Pushing the idea of local production to work with the local industry and manufacturers, including ourselves, who share the same studio space called Sugar House Studio, uh, which is five minutes away from the market, so which is there. Sugar House is a maker's space set up by Assemble. I have my office space within the same building, so as the graphic designer stains and squeeze. We share an old school building with many makers, from ceramists to metal workers to joiners and carpenters. It is a brilliant setting where design and fabrication are so close together. The collaboration happens organically, and we often work with the makers and other designers on various projects. As part of the design process, we occupied a vacant shop unit on site as a project space where we held a series of workshops and displayed our models and drawings. The project scope was multifaceted, including a new branding and graphic identity. This is a new logo designed by Stinson Squeeze. And the logo is used for new signage located strategically in various places. This one, for example, is placed on top of existing lift shaft, the tallest tower close to the marketplace. The typeface is bespoke. It is a mix of old Trojan and modern future, continuing market's religious origin, whilst subtly subverting it to the contemporary design. And the logo is hand painted on existing walls to act as wayfinding. It is also applied to the metal cycle barriers and the gate to enter the market, which were all fabricated by the sugar house metal worker Jump Studio. There was an existing wrought iron lion statue. We originally proposed to relocate it to the rooftop because we thought it was rather ugly. And also we wanted to locate a new water fountain in the location of the lion. Um, like uh, this image. This model was used for the first public consultation. The local got furious and shouted at us you can't touch our lion. The funny thing is that no one cared about the lion before until we proposed to relocate it. Yeah, the, the lion is here on the, on the rooftop. And this, uh, this is the location of the proposed water fountain. Sometimes the community needs to be provoked. Then the people get together and resist it. We withdrew the idea very quickly. But it also gave us the new idea, using the lion as a main figure to establish the blue's renewed identity. This is the Barmanzi coat of arms, comprising the figures of lion, clown, ship, and letter B. We asked the people to draw their own lion from the coat of arms, because each drawing is unique. We set up the gazebo in the market, inviting people to create their own by drawing and making. You know, it was also the idea of talk about the history of the place while drawing and making. This craft technique is called ruposi, etching onto a metal sheet using hammer and chisel. It is easy to do, but takes a bit of time it's about 15 to minutes to half an hour. 
it's long enough to have a chat and talk about the market and its history while making. The Blue Market owes its name to a pub called the Blue Anchor, which may be something to do with the Anchorite who gave spiritual counsel to pilgrims for whom blue would have been a sacred color. Because the market has the religious origin, we looked at the typology called market cross. It is a standing stone located in the center of a market square in the market towns, representing the official site for a medieval town or village market granted by charter. It could also have once represented a traditional religious marking at crossroads. Its design varies from a very simple obelisk to a more elaborated structure. But it always functions as a center of the market where people meet. This is the market cross in Chichester, which co incorporates a crock. This one is in North Walsham. It looks like a UFO. Barmanzi was once a hub of industry. This is the old photo of a biscuit factory nearby showing the clock tower, which was the tallest structure in this area. We proposed to build a new market cross for the brew with four clock faces on top. It is positioned in the center of the market to create an anchor point as a landmark. People first didn't believe it. It is necessary. They said it is a waste of money. So we will build a one-to-one -one mock up using scaffolding poles to test the idea. With the council's help, we also invited a group called Castellas of London, who makes human towers. It is a Catalan tradition that dates back more than 200 years. We were competing here, which one makes the tower first. This event was a pivotal point for us to convince the traders, visitors, and locals, as all experienced it, its effect and what it does to the place. The tower is clad in metal discs, like fish scale. The discs are made from the lid of tin cans, manufactured by the local container factory called William Say. It is not well known, but Barmanzi was the world first place to manufacture tin cans. Tin, was, tin can was evolutionary invention and transformed the food industry in the 19th century. Tin is a chemical element used for the corrosion resistant plating of steel. Because of the low toxicity, tin plated steel is widely used for food packaging. This uh, family run company of several generations has these uh, tools and machines to emboss the tin sheets. And this is their factory. We wanted to decorate a disc with our own lions using the Rupossi technique. So we set up a gazebo again in the market during the construction. We did this every Saturday for three months, slowly accumulating the numbers. Sometimes it was busy, sometimes it was quiet as the market goes. But slowly and surely, we gather the numbers. The making of discs was, in some way, universal. Everyone can make it, from adult to children and baby. Here we collect the portrait of people who participated to the making. And discs are incorporated in the cladding. Uh, this is a technical drawing showing the setting out of how they are overlapped. Circular discs are very efficient to cover the surface with a minimum overlap. A corner detail of the cladding. Um, more detail. Another corner detail. 
Under the market cross, we installed a drinking water fountain. It is made from cast terrazzo called Granby Rock. Uh, this is a product developed by Granby Workshop in Liverpool using recycled aggregate from the demolition of the site. Granby is offshoot of Assemble, who won the prestigious Turner Prize Award in 2015. The existing concrete bollards are gathered together and stained in red to form seating around the planters. The Granby rock is used here too, as a connecting wedge piece between the recycled bollards. The wedge piece works as a surface to put bags, flasks, and other things between the seating. We also created the fixed market canopies. It was inspired by the colonnade from Horyuji Temple in Nara. Using traditional English oak construction, green oak construction, but mixed with the flavor of Japanese rafters to give fine grains under the roof. All joints are mortise and tenon fixed with pegs. Built by the maker, William Floyd McLean and his team. They were based in the sugar house too, and now they moved to Somerset to make big things like these. All the oak framing were prefabricated in the workshop and assembled on site just in three days. Um, the oak benches were also made in the sugar house. Joiner Emma Leslie and us conducted the making workshop in the market too, to invite people to decorate the face of timber dolls. All the screw fixing holes were capped off with these decorated plugs. Uh, these benches are very popular. This early diagram shows the larger urban interventions, how some of the strategic and in some way surgical changes to the existing built fabrics can unlock the potential of the blue. Oops, hold on. So this triangle bit is the blue market and made the adjacent street pedestrianized, which is this street, to connect to the existing high quality food industries, such as Nilsia Dairy, Mammoth Cafe and microbreweries happening under the railway arches. And these blocked arches, under the railway are going to be knocked through to make a better connection to the nearby tube station as part of the bigger regeneration project in the former biscuit factory site. So we knocked through one of the vacant shop units in the blue and made a new street, which makes the access to the market more permeable and increases the footfall to the blue. This is a nighttime view towards the knock through arch, archway. Small interventions like bronze plaques replacing some of the existing concrete pavers to tell the local history in more depth. We also implemented more bigger interventions like this street mural as part of the project in order to act as a sign and wayfinding. This is done by graphic designer Fraser Magrich, who won the design through the public design competition organized by us. The murals tell the story of the place. You can see the fishmonger Russell Dryden. Yeah. Is depicted in this fabulous mural by the artist Paul Butler, another commission through the competition process. We also helped to improve 22 independent shop front on the high street with the cross collaboration with the graphic designer Stenson Squeeze, who designed their new signages and identities. The red marked shop fronts are all renewed. This is the plan of the marketplace. 
the market stalls are placed uh, across to the high street and multifunctional public plaza is behind the clock tower. We call it village green. The early study of the marketplace illustrating how the village green can be used such as a performance event or extending the market or a sporting event. This is a craft market day. The traders spread out to the village green. And this was a recent event called Okinawa Day. I invited the Japanese community in London to have an event to celebrate the Okinawan culture and food with many performances and demonstrations. And this is a dance performance called Asa, a joint collaboration between London Okinawa Sanshinkai and Paris Okinawa Sanshinkai. The event was truly international. So this is my last short video, um, the finale of the Okinawa Day. It was so successful that we are now discussing with the Blue that the Okinawa Day will become their annual festival. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Takeshi. It was beautiful stories. Um, thanks very much for showing uh, all the process since the studios with the students, uh, looking at Japanese architecture and how you didn't like it, but eventually learn appreciation for it and learning it with the students. I think that was very nice to hear how you were learning with the students by building these things also and how it has moved forward uh, to these community projects like the Made in Bermondsey and how so important has been for the community and also for how, how nice is that everything was made in Cellar House Studios and how that we will also have a sample. I don't know if you if you checked, I can see that we'll have James towards the end, um, perhaps in person if 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 they are here for their the bread in, in Australia. So we'll see. Um, I would like to open it to the audience because I, I'm sure students will have some some thoughts or some questions on, on, on some of the pedagogies, but also some of the making, some technical and some conceptual, no, from the, the use of the workshop that, that you have, how you have taken the, the workshop as the classroom to some of the beautiful details that you are implementing into the into the benches, no, that they, they were uh, fantastic. In them. So please, anybody, camera on and, and some questions to Takeshi. Venga, guys, it's Friday afternoon. I know there is, I guess there is also a class from Melbourne joining in, in some of that one, so there is some other people around. Guys, any from class or anybody else, doesn't matter? They are shy, Takeshi, today. It's always difficult, isn't it? <laughs> Online. Yes, but... <laughs> We became good last year, but as you mentioned also, Takeshi, like a part of the studio of making the things, the one-to-one, -one. I haven't done one-to-one. -one. I used to do a lot of mock-ups in a studio, but this year after COVID, I thought it was very important to build something together, like uh, all the students coming back, build something on campus. And I think it was also um, like a value in that physical aspect of, of the painful act of construction that we call it, that they're painful, but beautiful. Um, the other day, the students are, 
are enjoying how heavy things actually are. <laughs> like they didn't thought it was going to be so heavy. Of course, I told you it would be. And things like that that are always very nice to, to discover. But you were saying, I guess, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, as I said, I want the learning to be physical. Um, it's uh, it's you include in pain, yes, <laughs> and, and suffer. <laughs> That's quite important, actually. Um, unless you go through in a hard way, you actually never learn anything. So um, <laughs> it's a, it's a deliberate. Um, uh, yeah. So. Um, yeah, after COVID, yeah, it's more like a celebration, isn't it? Get out of the of the kind of a you know close your computer and get out and then they build something together. Exactly, um, that was that was the the, the point somehow. Here, the, the lockdowns were uh, perhaps not as hard as in London, but they were relatively long, uh, particularly in Melbourne more than in Sydney. So we thought it was important that because there is a full generation that barely went to university and some of our. And I think it, that was part of the point of, of, of trying to build together. And, and it's, it's painful, as you say, but it's also enjoyable. And we have very good moments in the workshop or in the classroom, uh, testing some of, of the things. Um, guys, anybody? <laughs> Don't be shy, come on. Like uh, We know that we were very good during COVID at doing this, uh, these talks here and, and trying to talk between different people. And it's great to have Takeshi here. Catherine, just just put your admit yourself and and <laughs> or if not, you can answer as well. So oh, sorry, Catherine I, I... Chesterman is asking, hi, can you talk about starting your practice? Starting your practice. Talk about starting your practice. Okay. What's the what's the point of a question? <laughs> um I was just wondering about you starting your practice, um, uh, changing from working from big companies like David Chipperfield um, and starting your own practice um, in London and how many people work for you? Okay. Uh, yeah, at the moment, it's quite small, uh, three of us. Um, was the biggest so far is five of us, six of us, something like that. It's kind of a changes the size a little bit depending on the workload and also people sort of uh, move on go back went back to study and so on um it's actually started out very late i'm not that young <laughs> and uh, i never thought about actually setting up my own um but uh uh somehow uh, the yeah sort of a get long become a long story but um i was at 6a architects uh about well 11 years actually it's quite a long time uh when i started the 6a it was only five of us and when i left it was 45 of us i oh. think they got a little bit smaller now 30 something and uh one when once this the the practice gets to a certain size uh it needs to have a, some sort of a management structure um in order to keep the ship going and uh, i was quite senior in the organization it's basically tom and stefan and me was the director at the time and um, naturally i have to manage lots of people and towards the end i was basically ended up using uh, uh excel sheet mostly just sort of <laughs> trying to work out programs and resources and whatever uh which was i found it really sort of uh, yeah kind of uh, boring really. and uh, uh then uh i got commissioned privately um to help terunobu fujimori this uh, well-known japanese architect who was uh doing this uh, exhibition installation for barbican center um as part of the japanese architecture house uh uh, uh exhibition and uh I was asked him by him to help him to build this tea house uh, with my student. So um, I basically jump off the ship, you know, okay, yeah, to do this, I can't do this, you know, part time. I need to dedicate my time to do that. So, and that's how basically started, you know, and I didn't have anything else in my line in terms of sort of a commission. It was a little bit of a 
um, scary moment to take a plunge, but you know, some <laughs> managed to survive now. Um, uh, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, I want to talk about that actually a little bit. So I want to grow, I have a bit of small ambition to grow practice to the size of 12. That's my sort of the goal or the aim. I don't know how long it will take, but um, so yeah, all the practices I worked, David Chipperfield, House Tompkins, 6A, they grew really big, you know. Uh, I started with small numbers and the happiest time I remember is always about, about you know, 12, 12 people. So that's kind of my my number. Why twelve Takeshi? Is just because it's the size that you remember as as good that it allows slightly big projects, but it's still not too much management. Everybody knows each other. Or is there any fetish on the number twelve or not? Yeah, I wonder. You know, this is, why doesn't you know this is, twelve is a magic number? I think I'm kind of interested in why this number. But you know, always find that that is a really good size. As you say, you know, you could, you know, big enough to do uh, kind of a substantial work, but small enough to be able to, I guess, know each other, uh, what's going on, and so on. So and allow somehow, like, no, like a group of three small projects running simultaneously, or or a big project with everybody, or, or things like mm. that. Yeah, and also you are always open to collaborations with other practices, no? As you were explaining in, in made in Bermondsey, so I think your size matters, but actually you rely a lot on the local network that you have to, to make other things. And I imagine you you would always like to keep that that opportunity, you know, to keep up for collaborations for bigger or smaller jobs where some expertise is that you don't necessarily or your practice wouldn't have. And I think that would be also nice to keep when you scale up, no, I imagine. Yes, yeah, that's uh, also happening. The, you know, we collaborate, work with other architecture practices, um, the bigger practices. And uh, uh, I guess that's one another way to keep your overheads small, but to deal with a sort of a bigger project. Great. Um, I don't know, the students don't want to talk, so I think that they want to go to the pub. I don't know if they will go to the blue <laughs> pub or, or, or not, in, in the, like the one you were telling about, about London that was in, in Bermondsey. It was nice how these small stories are being embedded with certain subtlety into the project, no? like uh, how these things will be perhaps discovered by a little kid or by somebody in 20 years, and they will know a little bit more about the local histories of, of the place. So I think, um, if nobody wants any other questions, I guess we'll let you keep making things um, and, and, and the rest of us probably will go to the, for the, to the path for our walk. It's still, it's still daytime now with the change of hours, so it's, it's nice. And it's finally sunny in Sydney after a, many, a very rainy season. So um, Takeshi, we would like to thank you again and thanks to the Japan Foundation for allowing us to bring in Takeshi Hayatsu. And it was great. It was very nice to hear your stories about in made in Bermondsey. Thanks very much, Takeshi. Thank you. And a pleasure to meet you. Yes, me too. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks everybody for joining us and spending the afternoon with us. Thank you. See you next week for Momoyo Kayama. It will be also a very nice talk, architectural behaviorally. 6 p.m., same link as always, okay? Have a good weekend. Thanks everybody.